Hey, so we're back with part two of our integral kitchen knife video. In our previous video, we just finished forging the knife and now we'll move on to heat treatment. So that's that. Now I'll stick the entire blade, including the handle, into the forge and I'll anneal it. Annealing is the process of slowly cooling the steel from just below critical temperature, which has the effect of bringing it to a relatively soft condition. In industry, this is done in a very precise way using carefully controlled furnaces and so on, but I'll simply lower the temperature over a period of time in my forge, then finally I'll turn off the forge and let the blade cool slowly to room temp inside that very hot insulated environment. This won't necessarily be a perfect anneal, but it'll accomplish what I'm looking for. So, why the annealing step? All things being equal, I probably wouldn't anneal the blade here. I'd just normalize it. But, I want the tang as soft as possible for the next operation, and that's why I did the annealing. Now, there are a lot of ways of making integral bolster knives. I could also forge down the tang, I could turn it on a lathe, or I could do what I'm going to do here. Now, admittedly, this is pretty machine intensive. If you don't have a mill, you can do essentially the same thing that I'm about to do with a file and some elbow grease, but it'll be a lot more work. Before the next step, I'll quickly remove the scale from the handle using my belt grinder. Then I'll clamp my blade into my mill. Using a half inch carbide mill, I'll mill a slot onto one side of the tang, carefully positioning it so it runs dead parallel to the blade. Then I'll flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. There are plenty of other ways to work the handle on an integral, some of them a lot less tool intensive, but this happens to be the way I've done this one. In another video, I'll also do a hidden tang approach that won't require a mill. And as I said, if you don't have a mill, you could just grind and file this. But this will give you the cleanest results and take less time. Then I'll drill holes for the handle pins. If you watch my other videos, you've seen plenty of bevel grinding, so I won't focus on that. In any case, the trickiest aspect of this blade is not grinding the bevel itself, but as with forging, it's getting the transitions between the handle and the blade to flow smoothly. I do a lot of that work using these small wheels on my flat platen, using the radii of the wheels to achieve smooth transitions. I'll grind a radius in each side, and I'll also grind a radius from the edge back to the handle. Make sure at this point that everything is very symmetrical from side to side. If it's not, the blade will really look kind of amateurish. I also use this little unsupported part of the belt to help smooth these transitions without digging in. You could use a slack belt, but using this little piece right here saves switching back and forth from the slack belt to the flat platen, which is a pain in the neck. Every grinder has its own little peculiarities, and you start figuring out goofy little shortcuts like this after a while. Notice how I'll also run the blade longitudinally down the platen. I want a smooth line from the blade to the spine, but I also want to preserve the roundness of the handle, so I'm rocking it slowly from side to side to keep it a nice round profile. And here's the result. Once I get everything where I want it, I'll go ahead and heat treat the blade. W2 is a water hardening steel, so I'll heat it up to about 1475, then quench it in water. This is an extremely thin blade, and so I probably could have gotten away with oil hardening it. 
but by quenching it briefly in water and then immediately transferring it to oil, I maximize its hardening potential and minimize the chances of warping and crackage. Note that I said minimize, not eliminate. So, a footnote on water hardening steels. In order to harden any steel, you have to heat it to what's known as critical temperature, a temperature at which the steel converts fully to an austenitic structure, and then you have to cool it quickly enough to convert that austenite back to martensite, which is the hard form of steel, which is what you need in knives. Now the temperature and rates of temperature change vary for every steel. Hardening steel by plunging it into water results in a very violent change in structure, which in turn can cause the blade to crack and to warp significantly. This is why smiths generally try to avoid using water hardening steels. Typically, knives are made from oil hardening steels or, in the case of stainless steel, using air hardening steels. But, as it happens, I have a lot of experience with W2 and the steel has a number of advantages, including the fact that I just happen to have a piece of it in exactly the right size when I decided to do this project and I didn't have it in any other kind of steel. So, that's what I used. All right. We've done the file test on the steel, it's hardened properly, so I've tempered it for two cycles at 450 degrees for an hour each. Now for some applications I would harden W2 at maybe 400, but for a kitchen knife I'm willing to sacrifice a little hardness for a little more toughness. Once the blade's tempered, I'll sand it, making sure to remove all the oxides from the handle scale slots. All right, once that's all cleaned up, I'll cut and fit the handle scales. In this case, I'll be using micarta, a material that's long been popular with knife makers due to its strength and stability. Micarta is a laminate material formed from layers of material impregnated with resin. If you haven't used micarta, there are three main commercial grades available. One formed from canvas, one from a thinner linen material, and a third from paper. When you grind canvas or linen micarta, the layers are revealed forming a sort of wood grain look that can be quite interesting and attractive. Canvas micarta yields a very bold and somewhat coarse pattern, while linen micarta has a subtler, less in-your-face pattern. Paper micarta, on the other hand, has no discernible pattern. Micarta is available in a number of colors. Personally, I prefer linen micarta, but for some reason it seems like most of the colors, other than black, are available mostly in canvas micarta. Anyway, I'll be using black linen micarta for this project. I'm just cutting two small rectangles, then fitting them extremely carefully to the available slot using a disc grinder. You don't want a big gap in the handle, so you want to make the final passes in tiny increments so that you get a nice, clean friction fit. Once the scales are neatly fitted, I'll drill holes for the handle pins. I'm using what are known as Corby pins. Corby pins are threaded pins which mate together inside the handle. The slotted heads are then ground off, leaving a seamless pin. Corby fasteners are available in stainless steel, aluminum, and, as in this case, brass. In order to seat Corby pins, you'll need to drill an initial hole for the shank of the pin, then use a step drill to drill out the seat. If you don't want to buy a step drill available from knife maker supply houses, as are the Corby pins, by the way, I've got a video that shows you how to make your own step drill. Now I'll epoxy on the scales, making sure to get plenty of epoxy on the Corby pins. Good surface prep is key to effective epoxy bonding, so I want to make sure the surface is super thoroughly degreased.
Now I'll clamp it up and leave it overnight. Next, I'll grind the handle scales to shape and do any last minute adjustments to get the shape where I want it. The most important thing with an integral is to make sure that you get a really smooth flow from blade to handle. If you don't get that, all your efforts are wasted. I'll use various wheels on my grinder again to refine them, but I'm basically mimicking the same things that I showed earlier. Then it's on to a lot of tedious hand sanding. I'll take it through various grit sizes all the way up to a thousand grit, bringing it to a relatively glossy finish. And I'll use a number of different abrasive techniques to fiddle with various parts of the knife. One good way to make everything flow and even is to use a buffer, but in this case I don't want a mirror polish. I'm not really that big a fan of mirror polished steel to begin with, so I'm going to get it fairly shiny but not quite what you'd call mirror polished. Besides, this is carbon steel and it won't keep a mirror polish even if I want it to. Mirror polishing really makes more sense on stainless steel anyway. And that's about all there is to it. Here's the finished knife. Sweet, huh? Uh, no, actually not. An important coda. Remember how I said that water hardening steel sometimes cracks during the quench? One of the heartbreaks of cracking is that sometimes very small cracks can hide in your grinding marks and really not reveal themselves until you've done quite a fair amount of additional work on the knife. And that's what happened here. If I'd been doing this for any other purpose than a demonstration, of course, I would have just thrown the knife in the trash as soon as I discovered it. But since I was doing a tutorial, I figured, hey, I'll just finish the knife, stick it in my kitchen, test it out, and just see how long it takes for it to fall apart. Anyway, good thing to know, even experienced knife makers will lose some blades to cracking when using water-hardening steel. There are a number of things that can be done to ameliorate the problem, but the bottom line is you're just going to lose blades if you water-harden steel. That's why very few smiths use water-hardening steel except for specific purposes. One of those purposes is the development of hamones, but that's a subject for another day. Anyway, here's the lesson. No matter what kind of steel you use, no matter how careful or skilled you are, you'll run into problems as a knife maker. If you want to make really high quality knives, you just have to recognize that a certain percentage of your output will end up on the scrap heap. And if you forge your own blades, the likelihood is that you'll lose more than if you do stock removal of stainless steel blades. This is a huge bummer, but hey, it is what it is. I've worked on a whole series of kitchen knife videos. To see more, click on the links shown here. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel and check out my website, waltersorrelsblades.com, where you can find more of my work. You'll also find plenty more videos there that you can't find on YouTube with very, very detailed information about all aspects of Japanese blade making. Also, like me on Facebook at Walter Sorrell's Blades.